We move on to our next presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Mr. Dimitris Armenis. He's a managing principal uh, research engineer, digital engineering at ABS. And he's going to talk to us about central, central cooling system automation upgrades. Mr. Armenis, please. Welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our organizers for uh, this uh, wonderful event. And I'm very exciting, uh, excited to hear um, uh, all this, um, uh, throughout this event, all these different topics uh, addressing so many uh, vital aspects of uh, our um, um, shipping industry. Um, I would like to say a few words for my background in order to uh, understand why I'm going to present this topic to you today. Um, I have been with ABS for um, 12 years now. Um, initially, I was um, focused on managing our fleet management software, uh, nautical systems in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And after that, I followed through my research um, background on technology, R&D, uh, focusing on smart and autonomous shipping. Um, I'm also representing Greece, uh, the national standardization body of Greece a lot in ISO, TC8 Working Group 10, trying to create these standards that will put our industry into the next page regarding uh, automation, uh, autonomy and um, um, communications in general. So, two key words from Kongsberg today digital twin and baseline. Remember these two keywords because it's paramount to address all these challenges complexity are going to bring on board our vessels, the maturity of the seafarers and how human and machine interfacing will play a key role in managing um, the new technology that uh, will be coming on board. I would like to address some very fundamental um, concepts regarding decision making. So, um, the, the cost of um, decision making, how much um, is important to invest in order to have decision makers, it's always a, a big question. Meaning, you can invest in people, you can tra train people, to be good decision makers for your operations and then you monitor these decisions in the office, try to make corrective actions, but people on board are monitoring automation and they are working with automation for many years now to do their jobs. And we have seen several layers of automation throughout the history of um, vessel design coming progressively for into unmanned machinery space or, you know, control from the bridge. But what happens when this automation fails? Um, I don't know if you have any personal experience about uh, a crew member trying to control a process board without automation. There are a couple of outcomes. Either they can do it and they have the experience to manually control the process or they cannot and they will immediately ask for a service engineer team to go on board and fix the issue. So the question here is who is, main, who, who is main making the, the decisions on board for energy management? And this is not the crew. Automation is doing all the split second decisions required for energy management because energy is power times times. We have designed the vessel with enough power on board to, for, you know, to go through any unforeseen event you know, sea state or weather, but in reality, power is always changes. It's never constant, it fluctuates with time, and how much and how fast power fluctuates with time is a fundamental aspect to understand energy, the energy footprint of a vessel. And also, energy is neither being created or destroyed. It can only change from an original form to another usable form. And how efficiently this translation of energy from the original source to the final usable source uh, is, it's all about the right automation on board. So to illustrate and 
just trying to you know, create an energy map for the non-engineers uh, in the room on board. Here you can see um, the energy flows on a cruise ship um, with electric propulsion. Starting on the, uh, your left-hand side with the fuel as a primary source of energy, all the various translations to low temperature water, high temperature water, exhaust gas, electrical and steam energy flows can be observed in this map. In every translation and in any conversion of the energy, some loss is occur. So the correct, the players in the machinery space responsible for changing the original source of energy to the other forms are, you know, the machinery items here, like, you know, the diesel generators or the propulsion um, powertrain or other uh, mechanical players on board. This is a snapshot in time. It's frozen. If I was to animate this diagram, you will observe the width of the arrows changes and the relationships change as well based on the actual requirements and the loads uh, occurring in actual operations. So, having said that, I will try now to um, explain a bit more on how the correct validation of automation board can help us optimize the energy management of our vessels by um, focusing on a very simple uh, system. Of course, I cannot expand to all systems on board. This is a, a huge effort. So I will try to use a single system as an example to prove my case here and my point. Let's discuss about piping systems. They are everywhere on board, and specifically the central cooling system, because now it's more important than ever to understand that vessels are operating with reduced speeds. That means reduced cooling requirements for the engine room. That means that the central cooling system designed for a total heat capacity to 100% uh, MCR, it's not required anymore. So there is a potential for, invest, for, for reducing the cost by analyzing this system, which is universal across, across any, time of, any type of vessel or um, uh, operating profile. So that being said, piping systems account for nearly 20% of the world's electrical energy used by electric motors. And they account nearly 25 to 50% for the total electrical energy consumed on board. So there is a huge uh, room for improvement, especially if we try to think of them as a variable uh, flow systems uh, from now on. And how, how we can do that, how we can reduce the cost of a piping system, first of all, we need to understand w which costs we should be reducing. I have grouped here four main group categories. The initial cost, which is the initial investment or the capex if you like, the maintenance costs, the energy costs and the other costs, which all of the, these three accounts for the operational expenses of the system. Evidently from this pie chart, we need to reduce the energy costs and the maintenance costs. And here's how. For um, many years, other industries have adopted a way of designing systems called model-based system engineering. What they have done through that is to invest very early during the life cycle of the system into creating a model or digital twin under first principles and all the physical and mathematical equations we have already you know, established as engineers that these systems should be um, accounting for and take through this blue line the total life cycle cost reduction of each system because they do have a reference of how the system should be operating in various operational conditions well before it has been designed as a prototype. So there is a way to create a digital system, test the automation, take these design decisions that will provide a multi-objective optimization of the problem and then start building it testing it and deliver it to the client. Marine industry is riding the orange line, the traditional system engineering curve, which means some initial assumptions occur at the design stage and then the prototype is constructed, then tested and then delivered with some small part of optimization per ship 
per operating profile, which is not the case. Every vessel is different, every system is different, every operating profile is different. So you need to be able to parameterize and identify how you can be more efficient per system, per vessel, per operating profile. And of course, per seafarer, because the people controlling that are an integral part of the total efficiency of the design. So in ABS, we have created a new team now working with model-based system engineering. Because we come from a classification side of view and our background and probably my team's battlefield in is Maritime Safety Committee, not MEPC, we are approaching that from a safety perspective and trying to see how this new um, complexity that is introduced on board, how much of that can be trustworthy, what is the life cycle of upgrades and changes, because as you know, electronics on board, they do not have the life cycle of the total vessel. So new components need to be upgraded, um, software needs to be upgraded and tested, and how this can be managed in a complex environment that we're going to face integrating all these different um, technologies on board from now on. In order not to complicate the matter any further, I'd just like to highlight this central cooling system topic because I believe this is uh, the very first example I can you know, discuss with you. And what you see here is we have identified that a particular vessel is suitable for variable frequency drives control. That means that the owner can go and upgrade that central cooling system to meet the engine load and the seawater temperatures that this vessel is going to be operated on. How are you going to test the control of that system without even go to the investment part and start you know, creating the retrofit project and ask you know, the vendor to provide solutions? Through this model-based system engineering approach, we do get from the shipyard, from the original design, from the older vessels that they are not you know, easy to find, all these system parameters that purely define that a central cooling system, and we can start creating some control strategies for this system in order to provide this efficiency. Like in the first part, the red uh, strategy here, we let the pump run at full speed, and we see the total fuel consumption and the cooling efficiency on the graph below. On the second part, the blue control strategy, we let the uh, seawater pump run at full speed above the temperature threshold, and below um, another temperature threshold, at minimum speed. The total fuel consumption and the cooling efficiency is observed on the, on the blue uh, graph there. And on the third control strategy, the same approach with different temperature thresholds. So from that simple exercise, we are able to pinpoint the feasibility study of this investment down to the particular efficiency of the installed system on board and to the operational profile that this vessel is going to work with and have the clear set of requirements for the vendor to address. So there is transparency between what the operator or the seafarer needs and what the vendor should be delivering. And there is a clear way to test it, you know, through hardware in the loop test to prove that the vendor had done the optimization work correctly. And this controller is ready to help your seafarers address the energy management problem on board, particular for this system. But the same principle applies to scrubbers, to um, batteries installations, to any other new technology that comes on board and needs to control the energy flow. So I'm returning back to my initial two keywords, digital twin and baseline. I heard the previous uh, panels uh, discuss about the digital twin of the machinery space and how important it is to create a digital twin of the machinery space before you are able to have a digital twin of the ship. And I fully agree with that. But in order to do so, you need to start going back to these engineering decisions made through the design of the vessel and through the construction to identify the key parameters that fully define a system. And when you do that, you have a way to have your baseline data. It's how the system should be operating in reality against what you are measuring now. And when you have that, you are able to trigger any maintenance um, 
strategy like condition-based maintenance or even plant-based maintenance to address the maintenance cost of that system. And the trade-off is, should I maintain it to be according to the recommendations? Is there any way to you know, do a different maintenance strategy but remain eff efficient enough for me until the optimum way of uh, delivering the spare parts of board or doing the maintenance uh, that is required by the vendor. So all these different decision making can be supported by the concept of model-based system engineering. So that being said, I just like as a final slide to demonstrate the work we have been doing with some major shipyards and uh, vendors uh, integrating technologies for the future uh, version of uh, some traditional ship designs. Here you can see uh, an LNG carrier uh, that integrates um, batteries in their propulsion, uh, uh, propulsion train, decoupling the propeller design from the main engine design and keeping the generator sets always at um, uh, full efficiency and also having uh, you know, different source of propulsion power and electrical power installed on board. Central to this design and controlling all these different elements in real time is the smart energy management system. This is the pure decision maker. The crew is um, reviewing and monitoring the decisions that this system is making, but the responsibility of the correct decision making every split second relies on the smart energy management controller. So that will be the brain of the vessel of tomorrow. And there is no other way to test it if you don't have a digital twin of this machinery space and a process to thoroughly test every possible scenario of this control um, strategy and the software implementation before you are start the sea trials. Thank you very much for your time, and I will be glad to answer any question you may have. Thank, thank you, Mr. Armenis. There is one question uh, posed. How model-based systems engineering can help with high-frequency operational technology data transmission from ship to shore? Fantastic. Um, so, the problem with data transmission is bandwidth. As you know, satellite communication, I think the next uh, session will discuss uh, more on that, is how to fit all this data we need from the vessel to our office. Um, having a verified model of a machinery on shore, the only thing you need is calibration measurements, meaning that what goes in, what goes out, and if there is a delta, an error that you can accept. If you do have that, you have a full identified system on shore that you can, you know, digitally um, take any measurement or any data you want in order to make any analysis. So, in fact, it's like compressing the information down to the minimum um, size required to have the full real physical phenomena replicated back to your office. So that way, I think there is the only way, to be, to be, uh, to be frank, you can get everything from what's happening on board with a minor error back to the office and start comparing measurements with um, wh what the system is telling you uh, and what you need to do. So, if there's any other question? Any other question? Not to be the case. Thank you, Mr. Romanis. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would ask you kindly to move to the right and be fitted with the... Uh, with the